Yeah, well, um, social media wasn't really in existence back in 2003, but they did have emails. So the Chinese didn't really take this too seriously. I mean, China's got some pretty heavily polluted places. Maybe it was, I think it was probably a lot worse in 2003. Um, so respiratory disease is, and a high rate of smoking. So respiratory disease is not exactly a stranger to China. So if you get a little cluster of a few cases of pneumonia that don't seem to respond to treatment, that's probably not a big deal in a country of over a billion people. But there was this email that went around kind of a chat list of epidemiologists and they took it pretty seriously. Uh, so when somebody showed up in Hong Kong who, who then got really sick from pneumonia, uh, like the full bore panic uh, came out. And of course they blamed the Chinese. In this case, it was the city of Guangzhou uh, near Hong Kong and not uh, Wuhan. Uh, and it spread to um, Singapore, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, <clears throat> Vietnam, uh, Canada really nowhere else. There were like one or two cases around the rest of the world. It was seen as incredibly infectious. Like, for example, there was a guy in an elevator and he touched, you know, the button to get down to the lobby. Mm -hmm. And then some hours later, somebody else got into the elevator and got infected. Well, that's pretty infectious. But there was an amazing accidental experiment that was done in China in a hospital in Guangzhou. The AIDS ward had some empty space. Oh, this this is so cra this is crazy. They put the SARS. <laughs> it's, it's it's the wow. funniest thing ever. Uh, so Go ahead, sorry. so the AIDS ward um, uh, had some empty space. So of course they put the SARS patients on the AIDS ward. Now think about this: the AIDS patients who had they were seriously ill. AIDS patients like they had opportunistic infections. They were clearly immune suppressed. Are put onto a ward with the most in infectious disease at that time known to man before this new coronavirus came along. Uh, this, this paper is very thorough and it noted that they, they kept the SARS and the AIDS patients on separate sides of the floor, but in between the two sides, there was a corridor used by the staff which had open windows on both sides. So there was free airflow through the entire floor. Plus, there was like a little uh, waiting room that, that the patients could mingle in. And in one case, an AIDS patient was accidentally put into a room with SARS patients. So they did everything possible to infect the AIDS patients. And anybody can guess that in the end, there were zero cases of SARS in the AIDS patients. So how can this incredibly infectious virus not infect immune suppressed people? That, that makes no sense. Infectious diseases always have a definition, but they are usually not publicized too widely because then they would be open to ridicule. They often have something like a suspect case category based on symptoms and exposure, and a confirmed category that adds some kind of testing. Uh, one of the definitions which was based on the WHO definitions for the coronavirus diseases SARS and MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, required all four of the following criteria. One, fever with or without recorded temperature. There's no universal definition of fever, so this may be just the opinion of a physician or a nurse, or even somebody asking the patient if they feel hot. With SARS, a fever was defined as 38 degrees Celsius, even though normal body temperature is 37, the famous 98.6 Fahrenheit, although now people think that that's not entirely accurate. Secondly, radiographic evidence of pneumonia. This can occur without illness, as was seen in one 10-year-old boy that I'll get to later who had no clinical symptoms. He was diagnosed with pneumonia despite no symptoms. Thirdly, lower normal white cell count or low lymphocyte count. And you need to listen to this carefully. Low or normal white blood cell count. This is not really a criterion, it's every healthy person who has a normal white blood cell count is included. Only people with high white blood cell counts, e.g. some cancer patients, would be excluded. And then the fourth part of the definition would be one of the following three. No reduction in symptoms after antimicrobial treatment for three days. This indicates it's a so-called viral pneumonia, one that does not resolve with antibiotics. Secondly, an epidemiological link to the Huanan seafood wholesale market in Wuhan, and thirdly, contact with other patients with similar symptoms. 
these parts of the definition create the illusion that it's infectious because most people will have a link to somebody else because that's an easy way to get a uh, uh, to meet the suspect case definition. A little bit later, the last three-part category was changed to one of the following, travel history to Wuhan or direct contact with patients from Wuhan who had fever or respiratory symptoms within 14 days before illness onset. It's not clear whether the no reduction in symptoms after antimicrobial treatment for three days criterion was still included. I wrote to the authors, I've written to several of the authors, but only once got a reply. I don't know if they're busy or they just don't want to talk to me. If not, this change in definition could help the Chinese extricate themselves from this mess as everyone diagnosed would be in isolation and therefore satisfying this criterion would be next to impossible. If they are lucky, those diagnosed will survive the medications, isolation, and other treatments, and after two weeks will be declared cured, and gradually the panic will recede. The big problem is that in contrast to the definition for SARS, a confirmed case initially did not require the criteria for a suspect case to be met. A confirmed case simply required a positive RNA test without any symptoms or possibility of contact with previous cases, illustrating total faith in the PCR technology used in the test. The World Health Organization definition has the same flaw. It was the fact that the SARS definition required both a reasonable possibility of contact with a previous case and symptoms that allowed the epidemic to burn out. Once everyone was quarantined, new cases of SARS were highly unlikely, testing stopped, and doctors could declare victory. But the Chinese eventually woke up. Uh, they were criticized a little bit for this. And around February 16th, they required confirmed cases to meet the requirements for a suspect case, as well as a positive test. This is much more like the definition of SARS. They may have put this new definition into practice earlier because after a massive addition of almost 16,000 confirmed cases on February 12th, the number fell dramatically each day and by February 18th was under 500 cases and continued to stay low. But other countries apparently did not learn. Korea, Japan, and Italy, and I think some other countries, have started doing tests on people with no epidemiological link, encouraging people with the vague symptoms that are part of the definition to go to the hospital to get checked, and obviously following up with asymptomatic people with a connection to anybody who tests positive. Consequently, in mid to late February, cases in those countries started to skyrocket. Right. There are many uh, problems with the PCR test. So first of all, they identified a chain of RNA uh, that they claim is about 30,000 bases long. And uh, so they start the process by taking, say, a nasal swab or a throat swab, and um, they then extract RNA, not necessarily the RNA of the virus. They extract all RNA. And they also have to eliminate uh, DNA and other interfering substances. That's step number one. Mm. That is not a perfect step. You don't get all the RNA out of that process. The second step is that you then have to convert the RNA to DNA because PCR only works on DNA. And yes. according to the world expert on RT-PCR, Stephen Buston, who I interviewed about a month ago, uh, this process is at best 50% efficient. So you only get about um, half of the RNA converted into DNA. And he said that the efficiency varies by about a factor of 10. So mm -hmm. you might get 5% or 50%. Yes. So by the time you finish the first two steps, the amount of DNA that you have bears no relation to the amount of RNA that you started with. Okay. You then run the PCR, which is a cyclical uh, uh, process. So you, you run it once and you double the amount of DNA. You run it again and you double it. And as you, you mentioned the cycle number, at a certain number you stop. If yes. you have generated enough light, not yes. DNA, enough light, then you are considered to be positive. And if you haven't, mm -hmm. you're considered to be negative. Yes. So this is believed to be the quantity of virus. But as I pointed out, you, you don't start with a quantity of DNA that is related to the quantity mm. of RNA you started with. Yes. So the cycle number in different labs, even with different people, will mean different things. 
but they choose a single number, 37, 45, and they run it for that many cycles. We know this is a problem. Uh, for example, in Singapore, they had 18 people for which they ran tests every day. They were all in the hospital. They were all COVID patients. And in Singapore, they were using 37 cycles. Okay. And 11 out of the 18 people went from positive to negative to positive again inside okay. the hospital. Okay. If positive means infected and negative means uninfected, then this means that people became cured and then they got infected while in the hospital with yeah. the most stringent infection control procedures. Yes. So it's hard, it's impossible to believe that. The, the more logical thing to believe is that the test is producing false positives. Yeah. Um, now I mentioned fluorescence. Every time you double the amount of DNA in the test, you, you free up some fluorescent molecules and they produce light. Yeah. And so to each cycle, you shine a light into your test tube mm -hmm. and it reflects, uh, it fluoresces at a different frequency. And you measure mm -hmm. the amount of light and you say, this means how much DNA we have. You're not mm -hmm. measuring DNA directly. Mm -hmm. If anything goes wrong in your test and some of the fluorescent molecules are liberated without, uh, in, a, in a separate process, then you will have a false positive because you will be measuring light that does not reflect the presence of DNA. Okay. There are just numerous problems. Um, this person I mentioned, Stephen Buston, recommended that yeah. you not run PCR more than 35 cycles yeah. because of the problems this produces. But in the United States, out of 33 tests approved by the FDA, the United States regulator, only three out of 33 used less than 35 cycles. Okay. So the others were running the PCR uh, test too many cycles and creating the risk of false positives. Mm. And the reason for this is because medical officials are scared of missing uh, people who are infected. Yes. But the, the cost of doing that is that you generate artificial numbers of false positives. And a paper from China estimated that if you test people with no symptoms, 80% of the positive tests would be false positives. Ooh. So that could mean that the, that the huge number of people testing positive in many countries is, is maybe only one-tenth or one-fifth uh, one of what's actually being reported. And of course, the epidemic is... Uh, the fear of the epidemic is due to the large numbers. So if yes. the large numbers are false, we don't really have an epidemic. The coronavirus panic is just that, an irrational panic based on an unproven RNA test that has never been connected to a virus, and which won't be connected to a virus unless the virus is purified. Furthermore, even if the test can detect a novel virus, the presence of a virus is not proof that it is the cause of the severe symptoms that some people who test positive experience, but not all who test positive. Finally, even if the test can detect a virus, and even if the virus is dangerous, we do not know what the rate of false positives is. Even a 1% false positive rate could produce 100,000 false positives in a city the size of Wuhan, and could mean that a significant fraction of the positive test results that are being found are false positives. If you run tests and you get 3% of the tests positive and the false positive rate is 1%, then one out of three test results, positive test results are false positives and you don't know which ones. The use of powerful drugs because doctors are convinced that they have a particularly potent virus on their hands especially in older people and people with pre-existing health conditions, is likely to lead to many deaths, as it did with SARS. <clears throat> there is very little science happening. There is a rush to explain everything that is happening in a way that does not question the viral paradigm, does not question the meaningfulness of test results, and that promotes the use of untested antiviral drugs. Given enough time, there will be a vaccine developed, and for some of the traumatized 
countries, it may become mandatory and universal, even if developed after the epidemic has disappeared, so that proving that it reduces the risk of developing a positive test, let alone illness, will be impossible. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia. For more information, please visit pasnia.com. Today, I welcome back my friend and colleague, Daryl Becker. Daryl co-founded ContentSafe.co with Matthew Raymer, a service of growing importance in this book-burning age. He is an acupuncturist, and I suppose the term would be holistic healthcare professional, uh, something along those lines, focusing on root causes and real solutions, uh, not toxic uh, pharmaceuticals. And maybe a better way to put that would be uh, real results, as he puts it, uh, not just hiding the way of symptoms, which will likely manifest uh, into chronic conditions later on. Uh, anyway, today we've got another important episode for you. Uh, as some of you may have heard, uh, previous guests on this podcast, uh, David Crow, uh, passed away recently. Uh, he was diagnosed with an apparently quite aggressive form of cancer, and uh, it got him uh, pretty quick, it seemed. Uh, sad in general, but uh, even more so considering the sheer uh, the focus, sheer quality, uh, and importance of his work, especially uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this day and age. Uh, there truly aren't many folks out there uh, like David Crow. Uh, Daryl and I, Daryl and I will uh, share some of his work. Uh, as uh, you guys, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning of this, I, I plan on uh, sharing a uh, sharing a you know 15, 15 or so minute uh, you know intro video at the beginning of this podcast. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, we'll talk. We'll uh, we'll share some of his work. We'll talk about it, and uh, hopefully encourage you, the listener, to take up the pursuit of truth yourself and become knowledgeable on these critically important subjects. Uh, science is, isn't just a hobby or an interest; it has major bearing on what transpires in the world and subsequently the state of freedom. Uh, so we'll stop with uh, the diatribe for now. And uh, Daryl, uh, welcome back, man. It's uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have you as uh, have you on as part of our self uh, health liberation self liberation series. Uh, but yeah, obviously, I wish we were meeting under better circumstances. Circumstances, but uh, how are things in tropical Hawaii? Things are great here. It's so great to be back on your show. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so I guess um, to 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 begin, since uh, yeah, as I said, uh, the the listeners have already uh, the listeners and the viewers have already uh, you know heard a fifteen minute clip. So they've uh, um, they've been here for 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 a little while. They've they've been hearing David talk. So um, I guess could uh, uh, this was this was a uh, this episode is actually yeah your idea. I think it was a great one. Uh, so, so we decided to do that, uh, do this. Um, I guess, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you came across, uh, uh, David's work and kind of, uh, your background with him? Sure. Yeah. My, my background was kind of new to the whole world of taking in alternative media downloads. That was back in 2008 and, uh, very, very, uh, pretty much the time when I moved to the big Island of Hawaii and, when I when I found um, I was just I had been researching the subject of AIDS and HIV for years before that. Uh, luckily, when I started medical training in 1998, the person that I was training with, my teacher Rick Warman, very much was open-minded to the idea that the theory of HIV causing AIDS was a theory and had books on this topic. He actually had books on his bookshelf back then. And, and this is really when the internet was really way too young to provide like massive access, 98. It's just not a lot of internet, um, ex like uh, excellent material being available on this topic. And so it was just, these kind of websites were just beginning to spread the word of questioning hypotheses. But I was, you know, beginning my training in, in medicine and I was, you know, ready to take on a questioning role on all types of parameters like that. Right. So I found, oh my God, uh, there was Gary Knoll, who was uh, someone who was also, um, I was listening to Gary Knoll and his show coming from New York City, a progressive radio host right now on a progressive radio um, network of various shows going on right now. But back then he was just on the radio, WBAI, and he was questioning the whole HIV AIDS hypothesis. And I was listening to that back in the early 90s. So I was already steeped in the idea that it's completely a great idea to question widespread medical hypotheses. And in fact, questioning scientific hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And and all this led me to just keep looking at it and, and building a digital archive of everything that would 
be asking critical questions and looking deeper at evidence. Um, this is before I even discovered the method of critical thinking that I, uh, the methods plural or the preferred method that I use nowadays called the trivium method. I just was applying myself to collecting grammar or data points on, on these topics. And it took till around 2008 when finally I found the show How Positive Are You? And you mm -hmm. can find it out there. It still exists at howpositiveareyou.com. And you can look at the about page like I did back then. And you can go ahead and go through all the shows that David made back in that time frame. Um, and he, he did a whole bunch of shows on that. He did the first 10 with Christine Majori. Um, uh, Christine Majori died very uh, suddenly in late 2008. So I remember listening to the episode where she actually died. Um, and, you know, where they're remembering her and, and, and her life and what that meant. Mm. Um, and it's like, it, it, it started opening my eyes to saying, wow, this is, um, not just an interesting topic, but potentially if you become famous in studying this topic, it potentially is kind of dangerous. I, I wonder, cause again, uh, when I look into the deaths of, of a lot of people who are prominent, um, thinking of course, Christine Majori. I'm, I'm thinking, of course, now um, more recently, David Crow, and of course, from last year, the inventor of the PCR test, Carrie Mullis. Um, the, the methods of their death seem to me unnecessary. So I kind of, um, or, or rather, sometimes not matching in the case of, of Carrie Mullis and Christine Majori dying uh, allegedly of pneumonia, which I often would equate as dying from the treatment in a hospital of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, you can easily die of treatments, basically. So I came upon um, David Crow's work because I found that he was calm and rational and would lay out piece by piece all types of evidence that he was heading up the Alberta Reappraising Aid Society and I uh, believe eventually, of course, he became president of Rethinking AIDS, which still exists out there as a website. Um, a, lot of, a lot of these places are not in any way highly funded. They are underfunded, which is why when you go to look at them, they're unsecured sites that Google does not like or rank in any way. Um, David was a fascinating person to listen to. And then it was only last year that I actually discovered that he had a brand new podcast called The Infectious Myth Podcast. And that was um, that was really fascinating to find it. And, and then eventually when the whole COVID thing began to happen, he was right there on the front lines mm -hmm. exposing once again, like I would say investigating with an open mind. That's that's a better way of putting it than exposing, but just really deeply investigating without fear or without needing to promote an official story exactly what might be going on based on evidence. So that's like kind of like the the long story of my studying David Crow. Right. Very we have yeah, very good very good. So so I guess um there you you, you kind of mentioned one thing there and it was something I have in the outline that I think we need to at least bring up because I, I think it's 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 worth yeah it's it's worth mentioning from from some of the uh I guess from 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 some of the uh, some 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 events that have transpired. Um, but uh, uh, you mentioned the the uh, suspicious deaths. Um, Monica Perez of the Propaganda Reports um, kind of posits she's she like her 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 position on is like well, you know she got diagnosed and, you know diagnosed within a month he was dead. Like so the, like this is super like and and uh, you know like this technology like uh, you know so a lot some of this technology has been uh, you know debuted in Congress like uh, um, they can uh, they can like heat up your tissues with you know like with electric guns like it's all that been Stone talked about it in his book, Station Diversion Sabotage. Um, so, like these these things kind of exist. So, like and 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 obviously, like I said in the in, in my introduction, he's a really important. He was, he was a really important person right now. Um, like uh, you, you look at uh, um, his his work on Sorrows previously, and you look at um, all of the resources available on his site with uh, you know uh, with podcasts and, uh, and 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 these these really good re these really good papers from qualified people, you know you know highly qualified people who um, you know would would you know would would know what they were talking about. Um, so um, he was a, a really important person. But anyway, um, do you do you think there? I, I, I don't know. Um, I guess uh, you you kind of have a little back a little more background on it that this wasn't just something that transpired over the, over the course of a month. Um, is that is that correct? 
Yeah, actually, thankfully, David Crow actually began mentioning his illness, which was a lot more than simply a cancer diagnosis, uh, and in this instance, a late stage cancer diagnosis. He mentioned having uh, edema of the legs. That's like where the legs are swollen with fluids. And he also mentioned some of the treatments that he was going about, that he was in connection with medical practitioners who work with Gary Null, and they were there to try to help him with the cancer, but they did not, you know, he didn't mention anything actually being done with edema. When you have mm -hmm. edema, that is extremely dangerous. And the longer edema goes on, the, the more at, at risk you are of dying. Uh, I've treated edema in my healthcare practice. It's something that you have to take care of right away and that you need to be looking at all the vectors that are causing it and actually doing something effective about it. And so when I was, you know, listening to his his story of his own health in the last several episodes of how um, the Infectious Myth podcast, he doesn't really mention about getting any advice or doing anything about the edema. He mentions all these things, taking, you know, uh, medicines to try to halt growth of the tumors and reverse that process, which is good. And it's very important. But, um, you know, whether he actually succumbed to the cancer itself or the actual edema caused a cardiac, you know, uh, shutdown, which is one of the ways that it could be possible. I don't know because I'm not looking at the medical chart of mm -hmm. David Crow. Uh, so I have no idea what actually did him in. I do know that best I could tell from listening, it was way too little, way too late. As it is with many people, um, they just want to imagine that they can do it on their own and they're just not ready to have the humility and the courage and the curiosity to investigate and say, hey, wait a second, I need an effective healthcare team because this is not called healthy. And so, I, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I could have stopped. I could have helped him direct David, you know, to life-saving things that would keep him alive right now if I had been, you know, in any way someone that he trusted and was interested in. But I think that that's the, it, it's a nice cautionary tale. You trust the wrong people and you don't take care of important issues, you can die. This is what happens. You think you can handle it all on your own and you obviously, you know, the evidence says eh, you cannot and this is what happens. Um, I think that even in, in face of all of that, David Crow left an amazing legacy of, of great information. I kind of, um, you know, I'm looking forward to when we get to talk about the Infectious Myth book project. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to see that finished at some point, even if it's by mm -hmm. someone else. Um, he got a lot more done in, in, in terms of spreading the word of effective medicine than certainly I have. Because his, you know, his work and his, his name is you know, distributed across the world in, in multiple languages and to many, many people, unlike me. So I celebrate the impact that he made. And, and that's part of why I'm here. I'm here to celebrate and honor the work of David Crow. And, you know, um, there are cautionary moments where you say, OK, could have done better in terms of taking care of his own health. You know what? I could do better in taking care of my own health, too. Right. Yeah. Uh, everyone has that one, hopefully. But at the same time, you know, it's separating um, the man and who I could say could have could have used um, a, a bit more humility and curiosity to investigate his own specific situation. And then, of course, there's you know, the reality of his work, which is, you know, I would say extensive and prominent. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. And, and, and I guess I, I, I should mention, um, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction that this is, um, I am going to work this into our health liberation, self liberation series, because, um, as, as we've already, as should already be clear by our discussion, um, his, his, his work, um, his investigative research, um, is, uh, you know, a very good standard, um, to, you know, a very good standard to, you know, to, to shoot for. Um, so, um, in terms of, uh, in terms of us as, us as Venuans, uh, us is you know people who are taking our health into our, our own hands uh, and trying to educate ourselves um it's uh it's, it's a very i, th I think we, we can learn a lot from uh, learn a lot from his work and it and uh, the standard that he set um so with that said um 
I suppose uh, I, I could go into a, a little bit into uh, in, into to, to my, my my very short background with him. Um, but uh, yeah, as, as regular listeners listeners will know, I uh, I began a deep dive into to health and nutrition last year, uh, about the same time as uh, I transitioned to to this new uh, you know this new way of eating. Uh, and it was very appropriate timing considering what has transpired this year. I've, th I've thought about that before. How it was really impeccable timing, like just just six months before all this all this shit broke out. I'd I'd, I'd already been been I guess working on the, working on on these things but anyway um, the point is when, when the scamdemic really kicked off uh, I came, came across David's work really really early on I'm uh, pretty sure it was um, early March sometime um, now, by this point, I had not done much research into uh, the immune system or viruses at all, uh, but coming across David's website, uh, theinfectiousmyth.com, was a really, really important starting point. Uh, David had already done a lot uh, of, a, a lot of uh, work on the alleged SARS-CoV-1 pandemic uh, back in 2003, and even released the uh, first draft of a book chapter on SARS. Uh, I was immediately, uh, immediately uh, impressed um, by the quality of the writing, the accuracy, and uh, source citations, you look at the source. Every, you can go, you can track all this stuff down and verify it for yourself. That's the that's the point of all this this really good research. Is it makes it very easy for anyone to follow up themselves. Um, so yeah, the source citations within his papers and how he was able to break down these seemingly complex subjects for the layman with such incredible ease. And uh, just some of the the, the experiments, uh, or not some of the experiments, but some of the examples and case studies that he looks at. Um, that uh, that that really. Um, I guess really kind of show the uh, I guess the ridiculousness of some of these some of these uh, medical fantasies um, to to put it nicely. But uh, more generally speaking, I became a uh, regular listener to his show, uh, the Infectious Myth Podcast. Um, I really enjoyed some of his interviews and shows on say vaccine vaccine adjuvants because I hadn't looked into that at all uh, before before that podcast, and that kind of kicked off my my um, really you know in depth study into into that realm. Um, he uh, had a, a pretty incredible conversation with uh, with Dr. Andrew Kaufman um, that I, I I thoroughly enjoyed. I mean the list list goes on and on. Um, again, that uh, his website's theinfectiousmyths.com. And uh, I'll also mention that David and I were going to release a number of books together, um, as as Daryl mentioned just a moment ago. Um, yeah, I was really looking forward to working with him on that. We were going to do pretty much a book per. Um, I guess per infectious myth uh, that he that he talks about on this on this uh, on his website. Um, yeah, I guess I guess uh, the universe had other plans, unfortunately. So um, at least uh, at least for for right now, I'd still love to see. Um, I'm not the one to write the books, but I would still love um, to. Um, I would still love to, to to put to put together his work into a book, or or uh, you know Gary Knoll might be working on it. Someone cl someone closer closer tied to the family. But anyway, I just wanted to get done um, somehow. I think that'd be a. I think it's a really really important thing. So. Um, yeah, to close out this 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 initial point, I, I just I just know that I'm, I'm really appreciative of David's work. Um, he saved me a lot of time, frustration, and probably uh, fear early on this year. And I'm extremely thankful that I had the opportunity to spend an hour with him, um, hour or so with him, even if it was just digitally. So um, I'll stop there and turn it turn it over to you, Daryl. If you, if you've got uh, got anything here. Yeah, I just want to say that the in general the quick version is. David Crow looked at all the strong evidence that's supposed to support that viruses cause disease, that any virus at all causes a disease. And he spent uh, what looks like more than a decade looking and pouring over all the supportive evidence to show virus causing viruses of any kind, any type of virus causing any disease. And he couldn't find it. In fact, right. what he found was extremely shoddy science. And I think that that's the important part right there. That mm -hmm. basically, um, he also found that there was a lot of supportive evidence that there's a lot of collusion to cover up in this specific medical science anything that would poke holes in that question. And that's very important right there. Like that, in other words, Wikipedia would be complicit and Google itself would be complicit and... All, of course, every single medical college would be complicit in promoting a lie, essentially. In other words, there's, you know, they made Koch's postulates uh, in the late 1800s and even adjusting it with Rivers' postulate in the 1930s. And it, uh, there's never been a time where any type of virus has ever passed these very meaningful tests called postulates, you know, either Koch, Koch's postulate or Rivers' postulate. To ever show causation and, and starting with, of course, just showing purification and isolation. And uh, that's really, really important. And like, you know, to, to show those two things is what David kind of did. And I think when it comes to finding the people 
to like I would say take this work and finish and write them into books, the type of things that I would I know um, people who read books still are are going to be open to seeing. And then obviously, you know, adapting them to other formats for people to want to consume as well. Um, I don't know that who's the proper person to select for those projects right now. I, I know that, uh, that it's not me. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> really great at writing excellent academia that, uh, t- style writing that has everything perfectly annotated. No, I'm just not, not that me. kind of guy <laughs> right now. Yeah. But I think that there are those people who are out there and I think, I think some of them have shared the stage with David. I think some of them are involved in these kinds of things. And I think it's just a matter of time before the next hero of looking into the virus myth starts to pop right up and, and take a, you know, a stronger stance and a deeper look at this and, and starts to actually say, that's okay. I'm good at writing books. I'll write this book. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I guess to, to I'll, I'll cover this point because uh, you, 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 it was kind of uh, um, kind of kind of relates to to what you just said. But um, this is something Bill Cooper pointed out, and in, in, in the series, uh, the, the first episode to kick it off, it was a, a couple, or I guess it was a series of 1993 broadcasts of the Hour of the Time, um, where um, Alex Loglia, a uh, a uh, Veritas, or I guess a a, a Kaji member, uh, Bill Cooper's research organization back in the uh, in the nineteen nineteen nineties. Alex Loglia kind of uh, went through uh, he went through vaccines, uh, germ theory, a lot of uh, and and uh, a lot of uh, the books that David talked about, like the the kind of that's uh, um, that 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 work that was available back in the in the in the early nineties, and I'm sure got David started on this on this stuff too. Um, but uh, but yeah, this is something Bill Cooper pointed out back in the mid nineties. But um, after I had my interview with David pulled from YouTube, uh, I started thinking about this pretty seriously. That since Google and therefore YouTube um, and pretty much all socialist media, etc., um, are invested in the germ theory of disease, you know, all of the places people go for information now, before long, really after a few more waves of censorship, um, normies won't have access to this inform- to access to or really be able to, you know, find this information, uh, which unfortunately means that science will officially be dead. Uh, investigations into alternative theories and conversations about them will not be allowed. Uh, the notion that they are theories uh, at all will go away. Um, now, that's what I envision transpiring in the short term. Um, but I do have hope for the cause of freedom, obviously, or I wouldn't put out, I wouldn't put all this work and, and effort in. Um, speaking realistically, I just see it as getting a, a lot more difficult before it gets better. People have to see, um, yeah, people have to kind of see this, uh, see this. Uh, um, I, I don't know, see civilization collapse. I don't know how to put it. But um, this just means that second realm institutions need to include medicine, cosmology, and all these other areas, um, really everything. Because um, as we can clearly see, I mean, um, I, I've, I've said it a number of times so far, but I think like that I think we're really seeing the problem, like the, the main problem of the 20th century is like the, the Manhattan style compartmentalization um, throughout all industries, that you're, you're so segmented into one, one expertise, and that's the only thing that you know how to do, so that in every other realm of your life, you pretty much have to rely upon another authority. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when someone puts themselves between you and that information, a power differential is created, um, and that power differential certainly enables them to take advantage, uh, especially when it comes to critically important subjects like health. Um, real leaders give you the information to make themselves superfluous. Um, that's real de- decentralization. So, um, yeah, I'll turn it over to you if you've uh, got anything. To piggyback on what you just said, it's come to that time now where anyone who's interested in pursuing research on Google, you know, using Google as a search engine, using YouTube as a source of their videos. And they suddenly find that a video that was there that they were looking at that questioned things is now gone. And and, and the more they uh, people keep finding that the more normies out there, as you call Mm -hmm. them, are finding alt tech sites and platforms such as BitChute. BitChute now is, you know, like I actually had a client who's I, w- I would have to say is, you know, has not as steeped in these topics and certainly n- nowhere near as what you and I have, have looked down the rabbit hole, right. but gone, you know, steeped enough to be having questioned and uh, knowing the validity of not using vaccines for her child, you know, and, and the harm of that and noticing that, hey, lo and behold, all of a sudden, all these things that uh, these various YouTube channels that would actually call question into vaccine safety and efficient and efficacy are gone or rather scrubbed from YouTube and they're just not there. But lo and behold, they're all over there on BitChute. 
And so right. now I'll just go ahead and mention some of the other alt tech platforms. They're mm -hmm. also over there on Brighteon and DTube. You want to mention some? Um, uh, I, uh, I, I need to start, uh, backing up, uh, more, more often there, but, uh, I did start backing up, uh, videos to library, LBRY, um, so, oh, to, yeah, to of course, I was platform. gonna, yeah, there certainly is library, and there is IPFS, interplanetary file systems, uh, there are many alt- tech platforms where people can store their data, their videos, their audio, their writing out there that's digital. And there it stays because of the way the platform is built. And more and more people are becoming aware of that. That's why I worked with Matt Raymer to create Content Safe to try to deliver this. I didn't want to turn this show into a, you know, a commercial for contentsafe.co, but I will just quickly mention it that this is you know, um, this is the usual kind of thing. Those who are in power, whenever they want to create censorship and cramp down an ability for people to research and look into questions like what you and I both like to do, what they do with that pressure, it's kind of like using their hands to kind of compress a whole bunch of sand and that sand being like the actual data that people want to get to. And so they, they do cover the sand, but guess what? Some of it's slipping through their fingers. It's going, it's, it's, it's jump, it's coming right out basically. And that is the places, uh, that's where basically on the all tech platforms like BitChute, Brighteon, DTube, Library, IPFS, etc. All of these places is where the data is going to. And more and more people are being aware of that now. And right. so no matter what Facebook and Google and uh, YouTube choose to do, they can just try to stop people from publishing links on, on to those platforms, basically. But it's not really working right now. Um, what, what seems to be happening is the opposite. People who are curious are continuing to be curious. And I'm optimistic because of that. I'm, I'm still consistently seeing a positive from the more they just try to make censorship you know, effective, the more they're making the market for liberty, just like I think Ben Stone would say. Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would certainly, I would uh, certainly agree. And uh, I'll, I'll point out that um, the way that I found out about David Crow was, uh, it was actually uh, um, one of my, uh, one of my family members um, sent me. Um, it was, uh, it was, she, she sent me a, a bit shoot link. Um, I think it was a, a bit shoot link to to one a bit shoot link to something. But um, regardless, um, so like she was familiar, with, like she came across a bit shoot link. So like you are correct that um, the censorship is getting to the point that these uh, these alternative platforms are just kind just by happenstance or by necessity they're already seeping into uh, kind of seeping into the first realm. So yeah, I I, th I think you're right. Um, but uh, I, I think it, it it has to get it has to get worse though. Um, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, like, I, like I just said just a moment ago, I think it'll. I mean, I mean, obviously, I'm optimistic, but I think in the short term, um, things are going to be interesting to to put it mildly. But um, I, I guess um, I, I should probably should have turned this over to you um, right from the start. But um, I guess do you, do you want to talk any about? Uh, do you want to cover a bit more of uh, a bit more about David's background? Um, the, I guess the biography and the the uh, about uh, about the host page. Um, do you want to cover a little more about uh, David's work with with A's and such? Yeah, I would love to actually because that's kind of where it starts for me too. When I was questioning the very popular scientific medical opinions, so how positive are you? Is a show that was hosted by David Crow and Elizabeth Ellie, and that show does owe a great debt of gratitude to the co-founder, Christine Majori, who I mentioned earlier. Um, David Crow received an honors degree in biology and mathematics in 1978 from Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Canada, with a thesis and later publication based on computer analysis of many dimensional biological data to estimate evolutionary relationships. This research was the first to hypothesize and provide evidence that a species of plant, in this case, Biden's canada, was most likely actually a hybrid of two other species. In the early 1990s, David became interested in the scientific controversy of whether HIV caused AIDS after hearing a CBC, that's the Canadian Broadcast Company, radio program by Coleman Jones, Knowing about the corruption that exists in science from his experiences as an environmentalist and also knowing about the limits of scientific knowledge, he started a project that would enable him to render an informed decision 
on the question of HIV. The project, still ongoing, is to read all the major scientific literature on HIV and AIDS. In 1999, David founded the Alberta Reappraising AIDS Society with the goal of providing science-based information to people around the world in order to enable them to make their own decisions about HIV testing and treatment. In 2000, David became active in Another Look, a research organization established by Marianne Thompson, one of the co-founders of La Leche League International in the 1950s. So Another Look is dedicated to scientific verification of the common view that breastfeeding by HIV positive women is dangerous. As a member of the advisory board of Another Look, David has contributed a number of articles and letters on the topic of HIV and breastfeeding that have been published in medical literature or Another Look's website. After reading the news about a case of the specific case of Sophie Brassard, a Montreal woman who was losing custody of her children because she refused to give them AIDS drugs, David became concerned with the human rights violations that take place under the banner of HIV prevention. So he worked with legal professionals around the world to help prevent or remedy situations in which people are coerced into taking drugs, being separated from their children or sent to jail based on unfounded assumptions about the transmission of HIV and the development of AIDS. So he's also served as years um, as a board member of Rethinking AIDS, a website I mentioned earlier, an international organization of doctors, scientists, and journalists who all question the HIV equals AIDS theory. David was appointed as president to that, Rethinking AIDS, in 2008. And during his tenure as RA president, he hoped to make the organization a leader in the provision of uncorrupted scientific information to the media, scientists, politicians, and anyone who is interested in whether the HIV hypothesis of AIDS is, in fact, a fact or a grand illusion. Uh, he's written a number of, for a number of national publications, um, subjects including health, science, and technology. He's also provided summaries of AIDS science through categorized lists of thousands of direct quotations from medical journals, government documents, tests, and treatment manufacturers' documents, and the popular media. Um, so that's that's the quick version. I just wanted to mention as I stop reading and, and speaking right now, David looked really hard at the uh, two very important of, of the, the three main components, which is, of course, testing and treatment. Um, the, 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 there's three T's that I think you got to cover in your show, perhaps the three T's of any false pandemic or scamdemic or hoax that's going on, uh, like right now with COVID-19, those three T's are testing, meaning, wow, look at those tests. How are they made? And look at the insert. Oh, wow, they actually say this, this test does not actually provide evidence of being infected with the alleged pathogen. That's interesting. And then treatment. He looked at the treatments of AIDS, which in the beginning, back in the 80s and 90s, were incredibly toxic. Nowadays, HIV medicines have... I would say, become far less overtly known to be toxic. They're, the people who are taking those drugs die slower than they used to back in the 80s and 90s when those drugs were incredibly toxic and killing them. And, of course, trading diseases, which is the ultimate, of course. Um, I would say in the case of any viral alleged caused infection disease, this was a case of, of trading actual causes like trading disease names, basically, so that if the causes are toxins and certain nutrition, nutritional deficiencies that will cause problems, think beriberi and other, um, this, like scurvy, uh, every, everything, rickets, known nutritional deficiency caused diseases that indeed, if you look them up historically, were blamed on pathogens before even electron microscopes were available, they were blamed on pathogens and communicable diseases when they're actually in fact deficiency diseases and there's so right. many toxins back there's so many toxins that are out there in this 21st century environment that you can basically cause any type of symptom that right now is being blamed on covid-19 and back you know in the day when it was popular was definitely being blamed on hiv you can blame 
almost everything like uh, that's actually being caused by known and often undetected toxins and on also nutritional deficiencies. He was at the forefront of looking at that. Uh, if he had gone a little bit further into, I think, looking at effective treatments and then, of course, self-applying them, he might be alive right now. But he went the other way. He went the route of looking at it academically and not putting it into practice in his own personal you know, case or his life or, or like I do with treating people. So um, I think that that's a little note of caution. It helps sometimes to have a great man who's awesome at writing things out. And he's always like, you can listen to any um, moment of David Crow on air. He never sounds as angry or as upset as I can be found to sound on audio and video. <laughs> he, he always sounds really, really calm and is like the voice of reason and has oodles of evidence to back himself up. Also much better than I do in the past. Um, I just wanted to make mention that, you know, this is where David was coming from. He was really, really strong on having supportive evidence for everything he said. Yeah. Yep, indeed, indeed, and uh, and and if uh, we've got new listeners on, you know, our general audience on Fascist Tube, maybe, um, or uh, you know, new listeners to the podcast, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, there's there's obviously you know quite there's quite a his there's quite a history here. Like this isn't just like a uh, um, a brand new thing. Like uh, um, uh, I guess uh, um, something maybe we can touch upon touch upon real briefly here is um, like I said, yeah, there's a lot of history here. Maybe we can point uh, the listeners and and uh, and some directions of places to potentially start. Um, but uh, I'll just mention um, uh, immediately the first thing that I read, the infectiousmyth.com. Um, go read his uh, his book chapter on SARS. Um, the parallels, the overlaps there are there. They are um, so blinding. I, I, I read it in March and I, I, I remember I was talking, I was talking to people about it and I was like, so back in 2003, higher GDP led to a higher death rate. Um, cause I had, you know, more money to toss at ventilators and you know, the treatment at, at all of these things. Um, and like, it, it's like, I don't know, like you, you look at history and you can kind of predict the future, right? It's kind of funny how, how things like that happen. Right. Um, not really cause it's not, it's not necessarily coincidence in my opinion. Um, but, uh, Anyway, I, it's that, that's what I've got initially. It says, uh, go David's site is 2003 paper on SARS. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, maybe you've got some, some places you have, uh, you point the listeners to, uh, if they want to, I guess, go down, uh, go down this path because it is important, right? It, it's, it's about personal health, uh, yeah, personal health nutrition. Um, so I, I guess, uh, I'll turn it over to you. I think it's really important for folks to, you know, understand what are you actually looking up and, and how open-minded you are just to start with. So I have some people that I, I'm friends with who I have to say, uh, from best I can tell, they're firm in their conclusions. I know there's a quote, <laughs> this quote often going to Mark Twain, it is really much easier to fool a man than to convince him that he's been fooled. Mm -hmm. That there's that hubris that I encounter with a lot of people where they just don't want to consider that they've been fooled for a long period of time and the longer the number of years or decades in some cases that someone's been fooled the worse it is for them to acknowledge that yep. mostly what they want is they want confirmation bias they want to confirm that they've got it right so they're, they're scrupulous at looking and taking apart any sources of data that would be used to poke holes in the theories that they have been holding for a long period of time and absolutely not scrupulous in looking at data that is calling it into question and, and showing that it's, in fact, not really very accurate at all, seemingly. In fact, that it, it, it would be starting. I would want you know, the listeners out there who haven't you know, looked deeply at the viral hypothesis and indeed germ theory in general to look up terrain theory and notice that the terrain theory of disease is actually older than the germ theory of disease. It actually goes back longer because terrain was there in the beginning. It just got a lot more nuanced now that it's, there's actual measurements of people's acidity and alkaline levels in their body, something that I'm sure you, you work on with your own health regime over there, Shane. Mm -hmm. And then there's other components of it too, you know, like obviously needed nutrients that are there. And the study, the, the nuanced study of finding and treating toxins that are in the body and 21st century toxins including the last century's toxins are pernicious and everywhere um they have no odor 
They are in every single car, no matter what age a car it is. Uh, the longer you're in such a car, the more you breathe them in, the more they, they settle into various fat cells and other parts of the body. And they can be measured with various types of urinalysis, but not with a blood work. So because that, that's what this, unfortunately people think, oh, I'll get a blood test and the blood test will tell me what the toxins are. And I'm using <laughs> a stupid voice because that's not the right way to do it. Um, by the time a toxin registers in your blood, it's way, 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 way too late. It needs to be actually more accurately measured with a urinalysis. Some people use a hair analysis. I find that that also is, you know, I don't find that that be extremely accurate, but you're, you know, a hair analysis can give a picture of various other types of minerals, not just the toxic minerals that are known as metals. And so that it's the toxic burden, it's the the lack of certain nutrients that need to be there. That's the big cause, according to the terrain theory of disease. And so whether you, you know, of course, are one of those true believers in, in a theory, like a religious fanatic of some sort, or you're like me and you're a bit more agnostic, you can listen to the shows I did with Brett Finot on the School Sucks podcast on this topic. It's called This is a Test series on that. Um, I start off really strong on, on that series because I think it's really important to say, Start with agnosticism of, I don't know. That's how I prefer to start. I just don't know. And I'm open to being wrong. I'm open to seeing evidence that I'm wrong and obviously taking steps after that. And right now, having looked at everything I can find coming from David Crow across his life, um, that, you know, every, not everything I can find, but looking at a, like a, a large volume of it, having listened to many hours of his podcasts and read a bunch of his writing, I mean, the best evidence I can say is that pathogens of bacteria or fungal or viral, you know, as far as um, formats, they don't seem to be nearly as large of the cause of a problem as the toxin issue and as the de deficiency issue of certain vital nutrients. And that each individual is incredibly unique, meaning like that, lo and behold, certain toxins cause an impact that is much bigger on certain individuals and much less on others. So assuming that everyone reacts the same is, you know, the ultimate hubris. It's, it's definitely going to cause a problem. Um, I, a lot of what I'm saying, hopefully, is a nice scathing and I would say like a, a rational approach to reevaluating everyone. Uh, healthcare. You out there who's listening right now and watching, I think it's really important for you to take a moment to say, if you have health problems and you only have one healthcare provider, in this case, who is, you know, starts with a doctor and ends with an MD at the end of their name, they are a very indoctrinated person. And they, they went through a process of indoctrination, not too dissimilar to the indoctrination that I went through to get to my acupuncture license. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm aiming to do a show on this one coming up soon because I'm in a couple different acupuncture groups on Facebook and the level of sheer, you know, strong religious style belief in the conclusions that these professionals who have their license as much as I have mine, uh, they would conclude strongly and they're, they're, they have zero willingness to audit the conclusions of what they got from med school. You know, because it was med school for us acupuncturists, just as much as it was for any MD or chiropractor or naturopath. We all went through this process of endless classes and tests and eventually the dreaded board exams. Um, the, the process, and unfortunately for some of them, continuing education credits. All of this serves as just trauma-based mind control stuff, uh, to be blunt about it, that just reinforces the idea that what they got was true because of all of the many things of the, the sacrifice that many of us went through to get to our medical licenses, the broken relationships, the, the disconnection between family members and, and people having to move out of state just to get their license like what I chose to do. Um, the, the trauma based, I, I implore everyone to also go and take a look at the book Disciplined Minds by Jeff Schmidt which goes into a nice in-depth version of the professional training that happens 
to medical providers that actually limit their critical thinking skills. Um, I think uh, have you taken some time to ever listen to that book or, or hear about it, Shane? Um, yeah, I've, so I haven't read it yet, but uh, I, I've list, I listened to, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure uh, it was a, a series on that book that you did with Brett over at the School Sucks Project a, a while back. Uh, and then we had a, uh, uh, we had a, a couple, couple part series on LUA Radio on Scientific Consensus. We talked about that book a little bit. And, and so I'm familiar with it, but I have not had a chance to read it yet. Um, and, and I will mention that um, I think it's, it's, it's on, it's, I, I think, I think this is what I'm going to do, but I think I'm going to edit, edit those episodes down and actually toss those in um, this series too, because I think it's highly, yeah, highly relevant to, you know, to, I think it's, it, it's good to toss in here. But um, in, in terms of your question for Discipline Minds, no, I have not read the book yet yeah not yet but you know the audiobook luckily is out there you can uh put in your search engine it's still it's not been scrubbed yet um but basically into you know your proper search engine disciplined minds and unwelcome guests and it's on unwelcomeguests.net and it's the entire audiobook except for chapter five which is mostly maths and lots of numbers which therefore it didn't translate into good audio at least according to the narrator um i'm i'll just say that the, the point of this is it's really good to understand that if you're outsourcing your authority like saying i'm too stupid or slow or don't have the time to really come to the answer whether or not I believe what, in this case, Daryl Becker and Shane Radliff are saying right now. So I'm just going to go ahead and trust a certain professional who's delivered services to me and my family, medically speaking, for years. Well, that's the appeal to authority fallacy. And that's why it's important to learn some critical thinking skills, without which right. you're, you're basically a little bit in danger. And I'll also implore the listeners out there to consider that you can actually build an effective healthcare team, and that means it's composed of people who are effective in healthcare. Some people look under the topic of functional healthcare and, and functional medicine, which includes all types of professionals of various uh, licenses, basically. And some would just look for folks who just get better results. And oftentimes they do not have the medical degree or medical doctorate, MD, behind their name. They might be, in many cases, a chiropractor. In a few rarer cases, they could be an acupuncturist like myself. I think I could mention um, there's uh, there's a one who's been on the Joe Rogan podcast. Uh, God, I wish I'd pull his name up. Chris... Um, he's super popular. If you know who I mean, Shane, um, who, is who is Chris that? Cre Cresser? Chris Cresser. Is that his name? He's an acupuncturist, big promoter of, uh, functional medicine. And that means, you know, doing obviously a lot more lab tests of a, a wider variety and trying to, you know, get, gain a, a lot more focus on results instead of, looking through the lens of what is popular in terms of tr diagnostic and treatment modalities. And I think that that's, that's really important out there is that you can build a healthcare team composed of a medical doctor who you could use in certain circumstances to, to get you out of trouble, as well as people who are getting better results. And that could in certainly include a chiropractor who's trained in applied and clinical kinesiology, a type of naturopath to hopefully run a lot more labs and be making natural supplements a lot more available, and potentially even an acupuncturist to deliver treatments that are honestly highly likely to help and much less likely to hurt you, if you know, even if uh, it wasn't incredibly helpful, as unfortunately too many of my colleagues don't get a lot of the job done, in my opinion. But there are still great diamonds in the rough that are out there. So you can you can take control, and actually, it all starts with asking these questions to say, "Hmm, am I trusting you know an authority that's been indoctrinated? Hmm, I actually did read all of Jeff Schmidt's book, Disciplined Minds, and now I'm kind of wondering, maybe putting all of my medical hope in this one professional, whose literal beginning of his life from like, you know, pre-med all the way through getting his medical license was traumatic. <laughs> Maybe putting 
all of my hope into this traumatized individual is a bad idea. And just because right. they don't seem traumatized, by the way, that's the same thing as saying, I got spanked and I turned out okay. That's a bad idea, <laughs> you know, to put that hope. You think you're a good judge of character and you know that your doctor is not traumatized? No, 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 no. No. Uh, there's no going through pre-med and med college without it being traumatic because every single one of those professionals, myself included, having gone through acupuncture college, can tell you that there's a vast majority of information that we were required to spit out in tests, in classes, and in our board exams that we will never, ever, ever, ever use. And we don't use in clinical practice. In fact, some of it was actual counter to the clinical applications of what we needed to learn to get practical results. Hmm. That's a big disparity right there. So, yeah, we, we Shane, remember the show we did, with, uh, Stephanie? Um, that was a while back. Yeah, that was uh, yeah, 2017, was it? 2017? Right, right. And, and the title of the show? It was, uh, have that one? I think it was Scientific Consensus Part 2. Um, I, th I think that's, uh, I, I think that was the, the title of it. Yeah. Right. So it is very difficult to, you know, explain to someone that they've been fooled compared to just fooling someone. And also I'll, I'll make it mention that other quote that I'm about to mangle right now is that it's very, very difficult to explain something to someone if their salary depends upon them not understanding it. So I often encounter this with people who have gone through the degree process like myself. They would want to defend the process of getting their degree and that it was actually, it was okay because it was important to fail people out who weren't clever um, without recognizing that the people who were also failed out were those who were critical thinkers and free thinkers who would find it laborious and tedious to go through the process of basically being indoctrinated into theory, like I was in the germ theory of disease, and having to spit back answers that I will never find practical, useful, and as I indeed would want to promote as also false, you know, and erroneous. The germ theory of disease seems to be, and viral cause disease seems to be very false and erroneous. Mm -hmm. So when we were having that discussion with Stephanie Murphy, I was trying my best to be polite and, and patient and all of that. But at the same time, I mean, I'd love to just like look at this down the line since now Stephanie's further away from her medical studies and doesn't make the money from that nearly in that kind of way. I believe she's a professional audio artist and, and makes her money that way. Mm -hmm. um, that maybe there's the open-mindedness to say, you know, a lot of what was dished out was incredibly false. And in fact, you can look at any scientific discipline and 20 and 40 plus years down the line, there's a lot of recanting that's done to show that a false version was delivered. And I think that that's really important for the folks out there who are not scientific and medical professionals who haven't taken the time like you and I have looked at these questions just to take the time to say, what if you're wrong? What if you backed the wrong horse? Do you have the emotional fortitude to ask that question of yourself? What would be the impact on yourself, your children, your family for having chosen to back the germ theory of disease and viral causing disease hypothesis when in fact toxins and nutritional deficiencies were the actual yep. real major cause of those symptoms. What then? Yep. Yep. Indeed. Indeed. And that's been, uh, um, that's, that's kind of been, uh, I'll, I'll mention another book and yeah, not by medical doctors. Uh, it's by, uh, um, I've men mentioned it in the series before, but by Don Lester and David Parker, um, they are, um, let me see here. I'll they are uh, um, accountancy and electrical engineering, respectively. So Don Lester is an accountant and David Parker is an electrical engineer. So um, I, I guess it's the, the thing I'll mention there is um, it, it's interesting in this field, that, like especially in the realm of health and nutrition and and, 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 uh, and that there are some, you know, electrical engineers who have kind of gained, I guess, uh, you know, gained a little no notoriety to, to a certain extent. And uh, from from uh, some of these doctors who, you know, they, they went through, you know, medical school, they got their MD, you know, they're, they're you know, they've, they got their accreditation. Um, but their comment 
is that sometimes it's really good to have to have that outside perspective because they didn't go through the brain brainwashing and propaganda. Um, so they like there's there's less there's less barriers um, in the way of uh, you know of, of them just you know I guess pursuing the information. So um, I'll, I'll I'll toss that out there as, a, as, as another idea. But uh, um, yeah, the book uh, "What Really Makes You Ill: Why Everything You Thought You Knew About Disease Is Wrong." Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll recommend that because um, I don't know. It it just seems man, it, it, man, it really it really seems like just the germ theory is just cover for industry, whether it's big food, um, big pharma, um, big agriculture, whatever it is. Um, when you start looking at um, at some of the mechanisms of action of like like what glyphosate does in the body, mimicking glycine, um, like some of these things, like. My God! But at the, at the root level, like some of some of the, the the some of these some of these problems, um, some of these these toxins, what they do to, to the human body, and some of the, the ways they interfere with, uh, you know, the normal processes. Um, man, oh man! Um, <laughs> yeah, they they need they need some cover for all that shit. And then again, with the way with the model of science nowadays, nowadays, um, you can't really pin down which one it was. It could be any dozen things, as I, as I've kind of found out from my type one diabetes. Any dozen things could have contributed to it. So, um, it's it's also interesting too. Um, and and, and that same regard of germ, germ theory of disease, germ theory being cover for industry, that they blame everything on viruses, and um. Yeah, mentioned I'll mention this uh, for for your benefit, Daryl. But yeah, when I was diagnosed, diagnosed type one diabetes, that's what they said. They're like, you know, must have just been a virus because no one in my family had had diabetes. They said must have been a virus, and I didn't, really didn't think about that too much until until now. And it's like, oh, really? So it couldn't have been any of these other dozen things. No, no, certainly not, certainly not. Um, so um, again, yeah. I don't I don't provide medical advice, um, but uh, what I've found to be really successful for me. Um, and before you do it, like even, even like before, while you're doing your research and it's just a smart thing to do, right? It makes sense. Limit the ingestion of toxins because the less toxins you intake, the less use you'll need of your detoxification pathways, which are your lungs and your skin and, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah. What do you, what do you got, Daryl? Well, I mean, first off, I think David Crow would love it if, for sure, I'm, I'm pointing out important things for the audience and uh, for everyone who's w watching and listening and not just droning on about him and his life, because I think he was very focused on these big issues that we're talking about. Right. So it is totally a, a good thing. Probably like I'm I'm thinking that what, whatever the spirit of David Crow is doing right now, I'm sure that he'd be happy with the way we're trying our best to deliver the show. I want to point to this one episode 95 of how positive are you where he has john rapaport on this is back in 19, uh, 2015 um and basically john rapaport is still out there yep. delivering this type of information john rapaport his website is no more fake news.com he used the term fake news before it was cool before it was co-opted by certain other people and so he's had the website nomorefakenews.com for many years, as you could look up and find out. And you can go there and look at a lot of what me and Shane have been talking about in terms of various articles, because right now the world is under a new form of warfare that yeah. David Crow was doing his best to uncover, uh, a, a special type of warfare. I, I prefer to call it warfare whenever you make travel ridiculously expensive and difficult when when you make it restricted um when you when you're dividing people by in various ways the mask the pro mask the viral hypothesis people who take it as as a priori the anti-viral hypothesis who would question it and like you and i are doing um the true believers those who are questioners it's uh you know like the censorship that's going on just like at various other warfare times in history this mm -hmm. massive censorship um the one-sided promotion of a certain story on the widely publicized networks and and platforms yeah you know it's a version of war basically and and of course the biggest one is the economic warfare of how many people's livelihoods and businesses have been destroyed and that is very important right now it's like that there's been so much that is destroyed that it's you know it was a, it's a great time to pivot if you're good at that certain industries and businesses are doing super well um and of course the large industries that were serving up the goods and services for people 
uh, have been widely promoted. Amazon and Walmart and Target and all of the big box stores essentially are all open. And the mom and pop sh uh, shops and stores are essentially mm -hmm. shut down. And um, the transfer of wealth, uh, this is a, you know, it, it's caused a, th that type of destruction to people and their livelihoods. And that's the type of thing that I would say is either pre-warfare or full-on warfare. And it's something just to be cautious about right now. Um, I think that I wanted, you know, th I've always wanted, you know, David Crotus to mention certain things that I would not hear him mention. He seemed to lean away from bringing up politicians or politics in general and leaning towards just looking at the scientific papers and trying to convert them into lay person language, which was a great service to people. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> yeah, certainly, uh, certainly. Wait, before you go, um, did sure. you, did you ever come across, uh, John Rappaport and, and his sites before or, um, not uh, no more fake news.com? Not before, um, not before all of this. No, I had never come across. I, I feel like I'd heard that. I feel like I'd heard his name. His name sounds familiar, but I'd never come across his work before. No. Yeah, he actually was, uh, I believe he is an author of AIDS Incorporated and, so he jumped right in to be a, a person to just expose that along with folks like David Crow. Um, he was looking at the, the whole fake viral hypothesis from the beginning, basically. But he has continued, you know, he's just uh, been a fearless investigative reporter who is just plain old, not widely promoted or even looked at um, and I think that that's really important. I I hope that he you know gets on wider uh, distribution pl platforms. I, I think you certainly have heard of Brian Rose and and his channel. That, um, wow, I'm blanking. At London Real. That was yeah. what he did. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so you know, just in in questioning things, I think uh, Brian Rose had um, uh, actually that that goes back to when you were going to about to mention maybe um, the David's collaborative, David Crow's collaborative work with uh, another famous investigator, um, that would be Dr. Andrew Kaufman, another person on your show. Um, I actually have not interviewed um, Dr. Andrew Kaufman. Oh, not on your show yet. No, Oops. not on my show. No, <laughs> well, no. want to be on your show. <laughs> no, um, I, 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 I do have him. I, it's, it's in my tentative series list. Um, I do think there's, I do think there's a conversation. I, I haven't, I haven't selected a topic yet, but um, I think it would be cool to chat with him. Um, I listened to, uh, namely for the reason I listened to an interview. Um, and, and I, I'll be honest, man, like, uh, and, and some of the folks, I, went, I was at the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest this past weekend and, uh, yeah, like, um, and some people are training this direction, obviously, but like with how rapidly things progress this year, like I've been, you know, more open to things. So I've been looking into, um, I guess more of like, uh, I guess uh, more of like the, uh, uh, yeah, more in the realm of um, he was on. Uh, I guess uh, he did. A con he had a conversation with Sophia Smallstorm, um, who um, yeah, we've got. I don't disagree with her on everything, obviously. Um, but uh, um, but uh, I'm, I'm hopefully going to be uh, interviewing her sometime um, this week because I, I I think a lot of these a lot of these independent researchers, whether it's David Crow, whether it's um, whoever the, whoever the whoever these people are, um, <clears throat> a lot of these independent researchers have a lot of really valuable information to offer, um, and and what they have is time um and and i think that's why that's one reason why survival society keeps people tied up so much because whenever like for me with my uh, on my homestead like i was at home all day today like i didn't i didn't have to go into it to it into you know a nine to five job or anything so i had a lot of time to think um that's not what they want people to do because when you when you have a lot of time to think and research um you know you can you can you can begin to figure some of these things out you realize that you can um you know understand uh, understand and comprehend these things but um anyway um Point is, um, I, you're talking about Andrew Kaufman. I don't, remember, I don't know why I, why I went down that, uh, down that, but it's in line with what we're talking about. So hopefully that answered whatever, whatever question you had. Well, you also did listen to uh, David Crow talk with Andrew Kaufman. Correct. Since, Correct. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was one of the last like uh, productions that David got to make. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really good. Yeah, and, a, uh, really and, and what was your takeaway from any of that? I mean, you certainly. 
it, it introduced you to looking deeper at Kaufman's work, probably. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd watched a couple. I've watched a, a couple of things um, by by by, Kauf, uh, by Kaufman, um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess it was just it was just really cool to um, you know hear these these two really really intelligent people who you know just have a, a, a I guess uh, yeah two two good researchers. Um, yeah, I've come together to, to, to talk about it. So, I mean, I, I just recommend the listeners check it out. I'll put, I'll put a link in the show notes. But um, it's, yeah, it was, yeah, great conversation. Great conversation. Definitely recommend it. I, I might even go back and um, go back and, and re-listen to it. Probably should have before this this discussion. But, um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> there was so much to listen to before the show. I was doing some of that this morning since I also didn't have to go to a 9-to-5 job today. <laughs> and that was nice. Uh, I was mostly just listening to some of David's older interviews, actually. Uh, I, I would say that for the listeners out there, there are amazing productions that Andrew Kaufman made. My favorite is The Rooster in the River of Rats, and you can look that one up both on BitChute and on YouTube. Um, but basically, I, I keep checking, and apparently... Dr. Andrew Kaufman's YouTube channel still keeps living every single day, <laughs> right. um, which is amazing in this era of massive YouTube censorship where anyone who's not towing the public line gets taken right off. Um, I think that it's really important that um, the only people left who, like, if it was my, my preference, basically, the only people I want to be saying, it's dangerous to express these opinions. You could be hurting someone. They could be making a, a misinformed opinion. You, you, can't, you can't just question that germs cause disease and viruses cause disease because it's proven. And questioning it is dangerous. People will make the wrong medical choices. Yeah, the only people I want to be saying that are anyone who's old and on their deathbed because soon you're going to die and go away. And honestly, I'm not too sad about that, you know, uh, although... I would rather that you woke up and had humility and acknowledged like that you could be wrong first and had curiosity to look deeper and the actual ability to research like a, a younger person would. Um, but I'm, I'm sad whenever someone my age, and I'm 48, or younger would promote the idea that the questions that we're asking, Shane, the research that we look into and the show that we're making right now is dangerous. I, I think it's really important because I'll go back to the quote that I mentioned where it's very hard to explain something to someone and have them understand it if their salary depends upon them not understanding it. And the salary I'm going to point out right now is the emotional and mental salary of being connected to the people that you are already connected to. If your friends, your family members, your coworkers, your wife, your husband, etc., all of them, perhaps children even, if they strongly conclude a certain thing, such as viruses cause disease, it's been proven, end of story, no need to look at actual evidence to the contrary, then that means that you're going to actually have a desire to keep your connection with them. And if you start questioning that, you're actually going to you know, un unless you're really skillful with the way you communicate, you could actually break apart your connection with those people that you care about. So intuiting that automatically, there's many people that I know who would, seems like they would kind of rather die than ever verbalize that they could be wrong about that because they could be wrong about germ theory or virus causing diseases. Because to do so would create a rift between themselves and someone that they really care about or perhaps everyone that they really care about. And that's really important to understand right now. So I always try to add some note of patience and caring and empathy. As it does seem very likely that the ruling class who orchestrate this and other, I would say, psyops or psychological operations, they love the division that's going on right now. You can see the division and hate and vitriol on Facebook and social media platforms, Twitter for sure. And they, they're they eating it up. They love having all of us at each other's throats and, and having people alienated from each other and not connected and not doing business with each other. And the opposite of that is to be patient, to obviously do the cost-benefit analysis of what does it cost to be friends with someone, to have a close connection with someone. And 
what does it also gain you by maintaining that connection? And if all it takes is sometimes not bringing up certain topics because the person happens to be very firm on their conclusions and they don't have that humility or curiosity to, to go further and look deeper, there's no flexibility to consider various different possibilities, and there's no courage to actually face off and say a strong statement like, I'm not really sure that viruses cause diseases because I've audited the evidence. Would you be willing to audit the evidence with me? And I'm willing to be wrong on this, by the way. That could actually be a division between people. So if it's the dividends that you get from connections with people are much, much bigger than this small issue of what exactly causes a certain types of disease, then maybe, you know, maybe this is not the topic to bring up with those people. Though, honestly, if you love actually having a connection with someone in which you can actually bring up any topic and you're not playing a game of Minesweeper, uh, that right. game where you suddenly step on an explosive and, and you've ex <laughs> you, your game is over because you stepped on a topic that was explosive to them. Well, I personally love to have my unpaid relationships not be a game of Minesweeper. I like to be able to talk about any topic in my unpaid life. In my paid life with my paying clients, I understand that I maintain the connection to the point where I want to keep them as clients and I keep the objectives in mind, which is getting the work done. In the case of holistic healthcare, they have specific objectives and I find through diagnostic methods other problems that are going on and I bring them to their attention to maybe consider and, and do various therapeutic actions to you know, essentially cause balance happening. Um, but then you know, there's gonna be people out there where they're just kind of firm on their conclusions. They don't have that type of humility for self-discovery. The, the whole schooling mechanism of obedience to a group think and conformity to that group and everything that they promote and a type of philosophical apathy, that apathy where they don't really want to question the methodologies that they use to come to conclusions or how many different ways that they could have gotten it wrong over the years or decades. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that's that's out there. So just try to be patient and try not to cut off all relationships while at the same time be courageous on your own and find the courage to look into these topics. Yes, yes. Well said, well said. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll, the, the only comment I, I really have in response is uh, you back, get back, harkens back to what you were talking about earlier, you know, podcasts like these being dangerous, um, you know, questioning, questioning these things because pe pe people do their own research. They might, you know, make a mistake. Well, you know, I, I think it's it, especially in, today, in, in this day and age, um, blind, blindly trusting authority is far, far more dangerous. Um, especially if you just take a look at what's going on. Um, yeah. And, and I, and I think even, even not the most rational, even, even they don't have to be the most rational people, but, um, you know, it's just the, just the, the average individual, um, when it comes to, you know, trusting government controlled media, um, like that authority is, you know, seems to be dissipating some, um, so that, that's, that's, that's a benefit, but, um, it's just transitioning to, to the, uh, to the quacks and lab coats now, it seems like, uh, so, <laughs> Anyway, anyway, um, been going for for a little while here, uh, Daryl. I guess um, I, I don't really don't really have much else. Um, what, what was uh, any other closing thoughts? Any anything else um, that you'd like to say in regards to to the work of uh, David Crow before we close this out? I think David Crow would probably appreciate if we were mentioning other dangerous podcasts that could promote critical thinking <laughs> and questioning important hypotheses such as the viral you know causing disease any type of disease hypothesis um i certainly will i'll, I'll mention like some really like open-minded podcasts like the higher side chats mm -hmm. uh that's run over uh over there um in california uh, i think it is a very good thing to to make mention of of looking at all of David's work, both on how positive are you for you know like uh, back in the day, and the Infectious Myth podcast, I think it's really important to look at the channel of Dr. Andrew Kaufman and all the many appearances and many other shows that he's been on, including on the Higher Side Chats and and other higher profile shows, um, things with many, many uh, YouTube subscribers, um, thinking Richie from Boston and other other platforms like that. 
Um, would you would you be willing to name any dangerous podcasts and dangerous YouTube channels that come to mind? Um, yeah, and, and I guess uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, I, I mentioned uh, mentioned on, on podcast a couple times, but uh, Foreign Borealis that was the uh, that's more of a um, there that's far beyond just uh, you know health and nutrition uh, and, and kind of uh, you know questioning uh, you know modern medicine. But um, there were two two discussions on there. There was one with uh, Dr. John Apsley. That's where I found him, um, who's my my most recent podcast guest as part of this Health Liberation Self Liberation series. Um, and then there was um, I don't recall her name, um, but there was uh, another really good uh um there was another really good discussion on health um uh on, on that podcast and uh yeah uh, yeah certainly dr john apsley is uh um, um at least to, to a certain degree outside outside of the mainstream so um i would uh, I, i'd recommend uh, that that last podcast uh, of here on uh, here on vanu and uh then yeah those those couple uh, at least those couple of episodes on on uh, the form borealis about health and nutrition but just more generally speaking um that's a good one for uh, just a, a good one in general. Uh, beyond that, um, yeah, I guess I guess uh, nothing nothing comes to mind uh, immediately. I guess I could just look at my phone. Yeah, well, that's I mean, there's so many shows out there that are open-minded and questioning, and and right. obviously, I mostly I'm I'm very interested in having people keep looking at these topics of being effective with their own medical care. So I made the site notmedicaladvice.co. That's where you can find effective professionals to help you with your chronic health problems. And I do offer a free guide there, which is a video and PDF that help find effective holistic healthcare provider near you to start getting some relief for whatever your chronic problems are. And I've covered in a small series of shows that I'm gonna keep adding to, where I get to go topic by topic, covering how do you actually deal with this and i like to mention diagnostic and treatment methods that you've never heard of or never seriously considered would actually help you and what i really want to encourage people out there to do is to build a medical team and that starts with someone who's effective for your chronic health problem but it doesn't end there it includes a medical doctor who's on your side and will do your bidding and you keep them in check like a very dangerous soldier who's a little trigger happy and then you also can hopefully work with specific other providers potentially a chiropractor naturopathic doctor acupuncturist etc so that's something right there not medicaladvice.co and i got a youtube channel of that name as well very good very good um and uh yeah i, I guess i didn't i guess i didn't really find um, any other specific podcast to recommend? Generally, what I do is I, I I find a guest I really like and I'll go and just listen to all their listen to all their guest appearances. Um, and then yeah, I found that uh, um, yeah, as as we were talking about earlier, and I'll, I'll just mention I'll just mention this. Um, you know, going through Google and some of these search engines, it's it's really hard to do research nowadays on the internet. Um, so like I found a really like really good way to research is basically find you know podcasts and then ordering books and then going back to the original source material that way. It's a long drawn out drawn out process and it means that you have pretty much a book to buy every single podcast you listen to so it doesn't help much in that regard but um anyway just uh, a, me a method that might be might be useful to, to some individuals and uh, i guess generally speaking uh, as we begin to close this out um i think uh, websites like yours daryl and uh, just this topic in general is really really important um i mean we talked about it before 54 54 uh, of, uh, of people today with chronic disease um i mean you look at uh, uh you know the the way uh, I guess the the, the way things are the, the direction things are going now with um, you know maybe uh, you know mandatory vaccinations if you're going to be a part of that society um, you know uh, things like that um, so I think it's it's never been more important to take in, to take control of your health and to begin uh, you know this this course of research if you haven't already um, it's uh, yeah crucially crucially important if you know refer back to my interview with Dr John Apsley if we're supposed to live to our 110 or 120 years old man 80 years is short change so. Um, let's outlive the coercers um, is kind of the way that I'm thinking. Um, let's uh, get to our, our, our self-sufficient, uh, uh, self-sustainable homesteads and uh, with animals raised properly um, with proper with proper nutrition and such. Proper nutrition and such. So, um, Daryl, I appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, anything else before I let you go? Oh, I'm just really happy to be here on the show with you and looking forward to next time. Indeed, indeed. All right, guys, uh, that's all I have for you today. Um, VonniePodcast.com is the website. Uh, until next time, always remember, Vonnie was yours for the making.